Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claudio Pienis, and uh, I'd like to thank you, the organization, for the honor of being the, the host of uh, Professor uh, Chad Garfield, who is the speaker of this session. Uh, Professor uh, Chad socially constructs himself as a historian, as, a, <laughs> as he would put himself. And, uh, but his, he, he got uh, uh, his PhD from the University of uh, Toronto, and then he went on to become, and still is a professor of the University of Ottawa. Uh, he's currently on leave. He's the, the president of the Social Science and Humanities uh, Research Council of Canada, where he helps funding research in Canada and our parts uh, in, in this area, in this very important area of, of, of humanities. Uh, a very interesting uh, point about his research is that he, he is, so what can I call, an early adopter of computer methods to look into historical change. But I think I will leave uh, Professor Chad to, to talk more about himself to show us a lot of the interesting stuff he has been doing uh, through the years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to uh, Professor Claudio, who's uh, um, so kind, and the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, as you may know, it's a great honor to be chosen uh, as to be the closing speaker at an event because the organizers, when they think about this, they obviously the decision is they have faith in you that you'll be able to say something new and original and will actually reward the people for staying uh, uh, for this. Uh, now, obviously, from the point of view of the speaker, this is very scary. Uh, and I think uh, the last two days I've just really enjoyed and I've, I've learned so much and it's made me even more scared. Um, but I, I hope to contribute a bit and reward your um, uh, patience and, and coming and perhaps even uh, have time for a, a bit of discussion. Um, because I'm going to come at this topic from a slightly different perspective and you'll see lots of overlap. Uh, and it's great to see Tony Hay, and it was great to uh, attend his opening, and we'll, and hopefully uh, the end and the, and the beginning will actually connect in, in, in interesting ways. Um, and perhaps along the way, you'll see uh, why I've found this event just so interesting and, and exciting and inspiring. Um, kind of two points I'd like to make uh, in terms of why I think this is so important is one, uh, it was mentioned, Professor Claudio mentioned that, that I'm an historian, and and usually, you know, when, when historians talk about changing times and so on, our role, generally speaking, we're the ones that get up and say, wait a minute now, that's not new. We've seen that before, right? I mean, and we're always the ones that are very cautious about that. We're, we really emphasize and we look the roots of things and so on. Uh, but I'm basically convinced that we are living in a true paradigm shifting period. And whether we think about it as a fourth or whatever we think about it, um, I think the argument is that really since the 16th century, the print revolution, uh, the paradigm shift that we're undergoing now is truly fundamental. And as we'll see, uh, it's based, I think, on new ways of thinking about ourselves, about others, and so on. Uh, and I want to emphasize that today. The second part of this is the research council that I look after and, and our focus uh, is on people, uh, that, that our, basic, our, our basic focus is on human thought and behavior. Um, and, and you think, well, gee, uh, um, 
that's something that we've always thought about in, in a lot of different ways. But I think something's different uh, uh, in terms of in terms of all that, uh, and that's how we think about what we're doing. And basically, our focus now is to think about our our funding program, giving out fellowships to graduate students. Uh, 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 professors and research partners in terms of research grants and so on, in terms of kind of three kinds of activities. One, we're focused on developing talent, the kind of people that are really needed uh, across sectors today in the world. Insight, really advancing our understanding of human thought and behavior in the past and present with a view toward building stronger communities. And then those kind of connections across campus, uh, in terms of the campus and the larger community, in terms of Canada and the world and so on, those kind of horizontal connections. And we're doing all that these days in terms of partnerships. Uh, we, we think about ourselves as, as in, in an expression you'll uh, undoubtedly seen a lot and heard a lot, and, and I certainly like a lot, is that T-shaped, the notion of, of having a specificity but doing it in a, in a connected ways. So, so, but what's different? What's different about our era? Because you'd say oh, that's been, that was true the 19th century, 20th century, what's different? Well, I think what's different now, and, and it, it, it really contests this notion that you hear a lot that we're in a techno, uh, technology-driven age. Rather, our, 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 our kind of perspective is that it's really about new thinking, new behavior, that are being enabled, accelerated, and then influenced in iterative ways by digital technologies. So our emphasis is not on human beings being changed by technologies, uh, as more as what's interesting is that us as humans, as societies, choosing these technologies to help us do new and interesting things, new ways of thinking about each other. So what's, well, what's different? Um, and, I, and this is my favorite cartoon. I think at the heart of our era is a new attention to human beings. And you say, wait a minute, Professor Chad. We've always been interested in human beings. Think all the way back, Confucius, Plato, whoever you want to think about. We've always been interested in human beings. And I, I'm going to say not so much. Not so much. In my example today, because we're, we're all in the world of education at, at, at some level, is to say, let's think about schools. So, starting back, I, I like these pictures of the 19th century because that's the century when countries around the world developed mass schooling. And we developed a, a system where we put the kids in rows and so on. And, and you think, well, where did they get that idea? Well, at the time, you know, how do you organize a lot of people? It was the military model. Well, they kind of put them in rows. That was good. Or, or the new factories and so on put people in rows. Oh, they put the kids in rows. So that was good. And we basically did that, and that kept that way. They all through the 19th, 20th century all sat in a little row like that. Uh, and it's kind of humbling when you think about that, because the thing that we didn't ask along the way was, how do children learn? And it's turned out, as you know, we've started to look at this in the last couple of decades pretty seriously, and it turns out that this is a really crazy way to organize education. And that, in fact, whatever we learned in schools, it turns out, is sort of despite that fact. And, it, and, and it's interesting, a lot of research shows that even today, uh, I have about 18 minutes to effectively communicate with you. Because you sitting there listening to me, it's about 18 minutes, and then you start to think about, well, what's for dinner, and did I remember to do that, and you start to wander, because the human brain. So we're going to test that today, sorry. But we know that this is not good. Now, mo every prof knows this, right? They've, they've looked up, uh, and they've seen this. Hopefully, you know, you haven't seen that. But anyway, <laughs> but the punchline is we're now realizing that when we think about learning about schools and so on, that really, uh, uh, we, and I think this is part of us taking seriously a different approach. My argument today is that you can look across the sectors at this. And, and here, we're going to just walk across the sectors. And so now, if you want to be a successful business, if you want to be a successful organization, you got to fundamentally rethink what you're doing in comparison to, I would argue, previous centuries back. And let's walk through it. Let's look at the private sector. All of a sudden now, businesses, for the first time, are becoming customer-focused in the marketplace. And you think, well, really? They weren't focused on customers before? Actually not. Most businesses... Take the 20th century, people think about that. What did you do? A business 
thought they got a great idea, they got a great product, and then how did they, they we'll get a great advertising company, and we'll tell you, convince you, this is, you want to buy this. And then if it didn't work very well, we'd fire the advertiser and get a new company, and then we may go bankrupt, and that would be the end of that. And, and as we know, most businesses fail. The new approach now is actually to, to really focus on customers. What do they want and so on, and this is really, really important. But the same thing is across in the service industries. All of a sudden now, user, or, user orientation, who are the users, what do they want, how are they using it, and so on, collaboration with partners. All of a sudden now, workplaces, employee-empowered workplaces. In the past, we didn't worry about that. If you're employed, you got a job, you sit down, do what I tell you to do. No, no, no. Now we're, we realize you want a productive workplace, you want a powered, innovative workplace, you actually have to empower employees, listen to them, they actually know what's going on. Same with politics. All of a sudden now, you, this is why polling is so important, on and on. Citizen engagement. Politicians all know it's a very different way. It's not lecturing to people, it's actually engaging them. Schools, for the first time, it's not about the push, the broadcast of the teacher, it's about actually oriented toward, toward the students, even in health. I mean, it's a big revolution now, patient-oriented health. Who was it about before? And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, thing. We've gone from the emphasis on the teachers, on the bosses, on the doctors, on and on, to all of a sudden becoming people-focused. And of course, this is all the same thing because it's the same person. It's, it's one person who's a customer, is a partner, employee, on and on. It's, it's a human being, and we don't live our lives in compartmental ways, and it makes it really, really interesting. So into this all mix, of course, is a very different notion. So now nearly every company is getting more and more data about customers, sales, interactions. That's what it's interested in. That's what it learns about. And of course, the problem is, how do we really take advantage of this? How do we really adopt this new paradigm? And that's where things like all of a sudden artificial intelligence platforms, on and on, this has become a big focus. But it's not just about companies. We could take those words out, talk about schools. Same thing, students, on, on and on. Learning, engagement, trying to learn about the hospitals, all of a sudden, patients, intervention, outcomes. A very, very different approach. Government, citizens, user needs, desires, service standards, on and on. And it's all of this that I think is really at the heart. These deep conceptual changes all of a sudden are making the availability and the interest, the data tsunami, which, and it's really interesting, the metaphors that are always used about this. I mean, is a tsunami a good thing, right? And then, you know, you look at it, you know, it's like, whoa. Like, and it's, it's interesting. We, we like words, metaphors, and so on. Like, it's interesting, right? We're all looking at this, and it's like, tsunami, it's a deluge, it's like, whoa, and we're all trying to figure out how to handle that, but of course we also understand that it's really at the heart of our prospects in creating a new world, a new society that's really oriented around people, understandings of people, uh, because at the end of the day, that's how we're going to build, build successful societies. Well, you think about this, and I use the I IBM definition, um, I think about big data is characterized, it's often said, by the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, ver veracity. But what I want to argue today is that the, the real interest, why we have all those magazine covers on and on, is because big data now is increasingly about people. Human thought and behavior. And that is the reason why we're so focused on this, and we think it's so interesting across the sectors. So just look at these four dimensions, thinking about volume. Sure, there's lots of, of data growing volume and so on, but what's interesting is things like the 12 terabytes of tweets created each day, and every company that's successful now is paying a lot of attention to this in terms of how they're being talked about, and there are lots of examples uh, about all that. In terms of velocity, you know, the whole issue, yes, that's different, but what's really happening is in terms of all those trade events, all those transactions that are going on and so on, right? And in terms of that velocity and keeping up with that, whether it's thinking about fraud or thinking about all kinds of, of other aspects. Variety, this is really interesting because we have structured, unstructured data, text, sensors, audio, video, clicks, stream, blog files, more and more, and whether it's surveillance cameras or whether all the other kinds of issues related to things like customer satisfaction and so on, that that is the reason why this is all so important on campus, across campus, 
uh, across the sectors. It's really, really interesting. In the same way, in terms of this uh, veracity, in terms of the trust, and how can you interpret the data, how can you understand about it in terms of the different kinds of sources, and how do you think through all that? And that's why all companies, institutions, schools, everywhere is really focused on this now as such a complex uh, uh, issue. What I'd like to emphasize in all this, in terms of why our conversations are so important, is because the first thing we have to realize is that people are not particles. Well, why not? Well, because people are unique individuals. We're unique, interestingly. And two, it's context. It's about the context within which we're working, right? And so on. So that makes it really, really interesting. On the other side of this, and this is why I think this conference, as many of these conversations are absolutely crucial, is because on the data analytics side, we have a lot to share. There's a huge amount of overlap and interest, and how we can think about all that is, is really, really important. Well, a phrase that got introduced yesterday uh, uh, in, at our conference here, thanks to Claudia and others, this whole notion of digital humanities. And so you can think about that in terms of basically using the newest digital technologies to answer traditional questions in the humanities. You know, did Shakespeare write the plays? What's the genetic code of culture, for example? Who painted this? How would you read a million books? How would you analyze that? And so on. And that's certainly, certainly very, very important. And there are lots of examples going on now in terms of cultureplex, cultural complexity and digital humanities, and thinking about topics con uh, uh, connected by net of relationships, seen as complex networks, kind of images and so on that are familiar in other sorts of fields. You can think about um, projects like this one that, that worry about the growth of large-scale data sets that in, in which trying to interrelate those and, and looks across data sets and how do, we, how do we think about that, which is so important. This one, the structural analysis of large amounts of music information, for example, and adding that into the mix and how can we think about all that. But, uh, or for example, forensically, looking, looking back in terms of, of all kinds of interesting approaches to understanding humans in, in, in other kinds of, of contexts. What I find, uh, one thing that's so interesting in terms of that shared is a conference on, it was entitled Shared Horizons, Data, Biomedicine, and the Digital Humanities. So interesting. This was in the U.S. and it was funded by the National Institutes for Health and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And here the issue is, what are the intersections between biomedicine and humanities scholarship? And I think that's so interesting and so important and for epistemologically uh, for all of us. There's another example, the U.S. National Library of Medicine, for example. Uh, combining with the National Endowment for the Humanities to cooperate on initiatives of, of common interest, right? So, so fields coming together in really interesting new ways. I'll give you some, just some basic examples this. You can have fun. Google has what they call their Ngram Reader, and you can look through published sources uh, back through time. This graph goes from 1840, and you can plug in words to, to see when they pop up. And this is kind of fun. Here are two words. One is nationalized and one is privatized. And you can see, for example, the blue line is nationalized and that goes down and all of a sudden the word privatized pops up. Uh, and that's really, really interesting. Oh, this one's good. You can you know, look for the word Canada. It's kind of fun. Back in the 18th century, there's some burps. You can see the, you can see the uh, war between France and England that, that led to Canada being succeeded to to, the, to Great Britain, and then Canada gets thrown, and over the while it goes up. I don't know what's happening at the end there. That's a little disturbing. But anyway, you think, uh, we think that shouldn't be going down. But anyway, we won't worry about that right now. This is also interesting. We played around within Canada, different cities. You may know in Canada for a long time, Montreal was the, was the most important city, and that's the red one here. And then by around the Second World War, what happens? You see Toronto grows, and, and so you can do so, so that's the sort of a very, and you can do this with any words you like. You can have fun playing around with this. This all started in the 1960s, 1970s. This is a publication from 1977, Computing in the Humanities, when people started to, to think about this. Uh, by, in the 1970s, there was a Canadian committee on on history and computing, 1986, the text folks got in there, digital humanities, the birth of, of that gets going. I'm going to jump forward to this report from OECD that just came out in February 
that I encourage you to read because this links back, and Tony Hay emphasized this in, in his, his start, because now the, the focus is not simply on, on researchers using these new approaches to, to an, analyze kind of classic questions that have, are, are from the disciplines, but rather this says that this is so fundamental to understanding and responding effectively and efficiently to global challenges. So the notion now in terms of really coming to grips with the kinds of challenges that characterize the 21st century, that really this is, this is uh, at the heart of it. And so it talks about the notion of the, the new forms of, of data collection and so on, commercial transactions, on and on, and the potential payoff for international and multidisciplinary collaboration to address these challenges is increasing rapidly. So now the importance of this is not just for us on campus, but rather our ability to help make a better world, a better future, to really come to grips successfully with the challenges of the 21st century. This, uh, the group that did that, uh, had chair, vice chair, what's interesting, Brazil had a representative uh, on, on that group, Canada as well, and a number of other countries, and, uh, and I encourage you to have a look at that. One of their first recommendations, and that we've been certainly taking seriously, is the notion of the funding councils that have traditionally had kind of geographic political definitions that now we really must collaborate in order to really push this forward uh, and to understand the opportunities and limitations offered by the new forms of data to address important research areas. And that's one of the keys. Certainly at our research council, we've taken this seriously. Soon after I started, uh, we brought together an effort called the International Forum of Funding Agencies. We had a founding meeting in, in Ottawa with representatives from, from a variety of countries in different parts of the world and so on. We built on this initiatives such as digging into data that we'll talk uh, a bit about. And now our, our, our new objective, and, and we're so hopeful and, and, and keen on working with, with you here in Brazil, with Fapes here in, in, in Sao Paulo. Professor Claudia was, was with us in Paris working through the proposal. We'd like to create a transatlantic platform that would bring together Canada, US, Mexico, Brazil, going all the way down the Americas, but also crossing into Europe and to really, to really start to harness and, and exploit the possibilities uh, of our age. And our focus is going to be on this digital pilot project. And that's one of the reasons that, that I came uh, here this week and I'm so interested in, in the kind of conversation we've been having. The paradigm shift goes far and, and I think Steve Jobs emphasized this in terms of the new world that's emerging here now in which we're understanding that the magic uh, as he said, the, the, the results that make our hearts sing has to do with this new integration between uh, what was usually considered on one side and on the other side, but now, in fact, uh, uh, that magic is, is in terms of the integration. What's interesting is our students are picking this up. This is a survey of undergraduate students in Canadian universities, and the question was, where would you really like to work after you finish uh, your undergraduate degree. And the two companies that were most mentioned across all fields were Google and Apple. Really interesting. What I found most interesting is the students that most would like to work at Google and Apple after they finish are in the social sciences and, and humanities. Really interesting. And so the, this paradigm shift is being picked up by the digital natives. They understand the connections, and they are part uh, of this. Will they get jobs? Well, here's one example. The vice president uh, at, at Google, in fact, says yes, that uh, this was a couple of years ago, uh, the 6,000 people that they were going to hire, four to 5,000 are going to be from the humanities or liberal arts. And we see that looking at workforces uh, 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 across is really re interesting. One way I like to think about that is, is, is in terms of a digital triangle. Yes, we have the digital technologies, but on the other side of that is digital content, and I mean that in a robust way, metadata on and on, uh, uh, really important. And then what I like to call digital literacies, the use, how we use all this, and that's what's really framing our era. And I think it's an equilateral triangle, I think they're, they're all equally important and I think they're all connected 
And the magic, as it were, comes from that notion of that integrated frame. Now, there's lots to draw upon. And I think why our disciplines are, are, are have something to contribute in an interesting way, because when you think about it, managing content, thinking about data, getting that, getting that organized, and so on is classic. This is a picture of me when I was in high school. I had a job, what they called a page. And that was trying to make sure that everything was on the right spot in the library, because as you know, in libraries, things are, are classified by topic. And you got to make sure it's together. And we were always told, if you misfile, you may as well throw it out. You had to be in the right, and we used to read it, and, and it was really interesting. But that wasn't the only way to organize things. This is, this is the way archives were organized. One of the words I've heard a lot at this conference is provenance, and that's basically a focus on who created documents, why they created, and so on. And that's how archives are organized. If you go into an archive, you don't, you don't get all the books on this topic here, all the documents on that topic here, and so on. Everything's organized in terms of the person who created or the organization that created and so on. So very different ways. Well, in an analog world, you had to make those decisions. You had to put it somewhere. You couldn't put it to both places. You had to put it somewhere. Well, we said, you know, in the 1970s, early 80s, we said, you know what? Maybe there's a, a new way to integrate that. And those sort of, of divisions uh, don't make sense in the, in the digital age. I, I went to teach at the University of Victoria in Vancouver Island, very beautiful spot, a very interesting history and so on. We said, how about we build something that would allow us to get access to all the information, whether it's a book, whether it's an archival manuscript, whatever it is, in terms of the history of, of Vancouver Island. And we built the first, what we called at the time, an automated archivist. It was the first uh, SQL uh, structured query language application in which we brought together, we connected, all the different kinds of materials so someone could find out about the history of Vancouver Island. The same kind of approach got pushed forward if we jump into the year 2000. And at, at our research council, a, a report came to the conclusion that, that the new information technologies, yes, they're having an impact on humanities teaching and research, but the opportunity is for scholars, teachers, students to become informed partners and innovators. So we're not just using software. We don't want services, but rather we want to become co-creators. We want to build together. We want to integrate. We want to learn from each other. And this is the new, the new partnership, the new kind of approach. And so, uh, uh, so that the, the, the concluding here, to benefit fully, researchers must not only be able to be aware of technological developments, but also must be directly involved in them. And that's the new world that we're trying to foster, and it's a very different, it's a very different kind of world. So what's the focus? We built something called Image, Text, Sound, and Technology Program. And this is very innovative, and it, and it, it had a huge impact. And the focus was in terms of interpreting, analyzing, new digital media, multimedia, text-based computing technologies, and so on. And, and really bringing together theorists, experimentalists, technologists, different disciplines to share, nurture ideas, methods, audiovisual, text based technologies, and so on, and to facilitate the creation of national and international networks and partnerships, and, and so on. So some of the topics identified at that time, electronic editing, publishing, uh, web programming, textual analysis, imaging, a lot of the topics that have, we've talked about here. My own window on this, and certainly one of the strong traditions, was to look at certain kinds of historical documents and create databases out of them. This is a, one of the most popular ones used around the world, a census, an enumeration of census. These goes back historically, in the case of Canada, to the 17th century. And basically, the governments um, went around and kept track of people, asked them questions, age, sex, gender, and so on, family, household, on and on. Well, one approach could say, well, you could just take you know, what was said on these forms and treat that as your data and analyze that. But our approach was to say, wait a minute, let's think about that. How was this data actually collected? And so we, we started to study how the people who went around to fill in those forms, city and households and so on, how were they trained? Because we really felt that, that, that this was really key to that. And then we analyzed the actual process of having these forms filled in. And what was that about? How were the questions understood? What were the different contexts? On and on, and that led to documents that led to documents written in like this. And then we said, well, 
And then what happened to those documents? And we, they were brought in, and people were counted and tabulated and so on. But we wanted, under, wanted to understand all that process. And then, of course, the technology changed. In the 1950s, they brought in the new sense cards, and you use a little pencil to fill in and so on. We said, well, what difference did that make? And, and we wanted to try to understand that. And then we said, well, that had implications in terms of how the counting was done and, and, and so on, some of the early machines. And then we said, well, yeah, but, and let's think about that in terms of different places. And so we, we geocoded everything. We wanted, because everyone's not the same and, and so on. Well, we built a, a whole big um, set of inter interrelated databases, partnering with IBM using DB2, uh, in which we had, yes, we had the census data, what was written down on all those forms and so on, but we also had what we called contextual data. All, the, all kinds of evidence about how that whole process was undertaken, the enumeration, the processing, and so on. We had uh, how it was talked about in the newspapers at the time, how it, was, how it was talked about in the public, all the political debates that went around, which questions were asked and not, and so on, and then all the processing that involved in that. Uh, a, a really interesting, complex thing, as you can imagine, a huge project, um, uh, 15 million Canadian dollars, so 30, 30 million, something like that. Uh, big effort over, over a number of years involving all kinds of, of, of different groups. These sort of projects take a lot of money. Uh, as you can see, IBM was our partner, as I mentioned, but, but many, other, many other folks involved. Out of that came, and, and the analysis has gone on, um, uh, I teamed up with, with some folks interested in machine learning and so on, spread out this data, analyze it in different ways, uh, you know, using the training on and on. Uh, really, really interesting. So, so what are some of the lessons about all this from our perspective working this through? I want to argue that in terms of thinking about data, data are not neutral. They're not objective. In creating data, humans make choices, decisions all along the way what data to collect, how to collect it, how to categorize the results, how to interpret, how to attribute meaning, relevance, on and on. And categories I, I've seen a lot, for example, here on, on visualization. Huge choices you're making in terms of how you, how you, how you think about that and, and present it. So data do not speak for themselves. The facts do not speak for themselves. Instead, turning data in, into insight depends upon human interpretation. And, and this is, I think, a really key. Human decisions are embedded in software and the algorithms and so on. And, and when the data concerns people, and this is, I think, a really, really key point for all of us, when data concerns people, all these decisions, all those human decisions that we make, necessarily reflect theories, assumptions about human thought and behavior. So they either can be implicit, you cannot worry about them, or they can be explicit. And, and we think, at least, that uh, there's, we really need to think these things through, make them explicit, uh, because they have huge implications for, for, for what comes out. And since humans are diverse, remember, unique individuals and specific contexts, household, communities, societies, cultures are diverse. And I think that's one of the really interesting things. In the new world, for societies like Canada, smaller societies, for example, we worry sometimes that we'll get ignored or erased because a lot of the algorithms and so on are going to be built uh, in, in, that don't affect us. And I would also say it's one of the issues related to language. Uh, one of the concerns often is that English language ends up dominating a, a lot, and uh, we know that can be complex. Big emphasis has been on genomics and so on, and, and the, the notion of of how uh, human experience and so on is sort of uh, determined at the get-go. Uh, and there's lots of talk in terms of personalized medicine and, and, and so on. What we like to think about is that it's more complex. Yes, there's that on the one side. But on the other side, there's culture, there's social, there's technological change and so on. And all of that, I think, can be fed into some notion of big data. And that's our challenge in terms of trying to understand that interaction, that complexity, and so on, in terms of human thought and behavior. There's lots of big data available now in various le uh, levels. Uh, this is in the US, the international public use uh, 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 micro data, 480 million person records, and each record has several dozen variables, and variables can range from 
two to three, say two values up to thousands. So uh, spreading that out is pretty interesting. I mentioned our digging into data challenge where we've joined with other countries to, to try to think about how can we really, how can we really start to analyze this, this, uh, this corpus and, and the complexity of it. And there are lots of good examples uh, uh, of, of the kinds of, of, of uh, projects that are being funded all kinds of, of different things, new tools being developed, new kinds of epistemologies being developed. And, and here's some reading that, uh, in, in case any of that's interested in terms of things like culturomics and, and where that's all going. In the OECD report, there's also a nice slide that, that tries to bring together the new forms of data in terms of whether it's government transactions, uh, uh, you know, everything from uh, property tax records, population records, health records, on and on to commercial ones, the stores, our visa accounts, customer accounts, all those sorts of things, internet usage, social media, the networks, the traffic in terms of, of, of the sensors, on and on, and, and I think that shows the potential. How big is all this? How important is all this? Well, Nature had an, argu uh, an article you may have seen uh, in terms of talking about the humanities and, and, and cultural databases, and it's, it, it, it uh, listed, of course, the, the Holdren, um, uh, 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 the, the H H Hadron uh, Collider in terms of the, the kind of petabytes that that's putting out, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Gen Bank, and so on. But its point was that the computer storage space required to support projects in the digital humanities now is now starting to rival that of the big science projects. And they had a couple of the, the I, you know, I mentioned the engrams uh, of Google and, and just the string of letters in this corpus of five million books is a thousand times longer than the human genome. Or, or a year of speech, for example, all the conversations, broadcast news, and on and on. Or even archives, like the California show archives that, that is just videotapes of, of interviews with Holocaust survivors and so on. And, and they just multiply this all on and on. It's not just changing businesses. I think our campuses, our schools are fundamentally changing. We're redefining what we mean by education, moving from a teaching content, kind of an old school transmission of, of knowledge approach, to one where it's focused on learning content and competencies, what we like to call developing talent. Very different approach, student engagement approach. Research, we've gone from thinking we can advance knowledge and understanding by simply specialization, you study this, I study this, we're gonna add it up, it's all good, to uh, what I like to think about and it's often talked about is this research T, where we, yes, we have to study and we have to specialize, but we have to connect it. We have to contextualize it, why? Because at the end of the day, it's intimately interrelated, connected, interactive, non-linear, on and on. And in terms of innovation, how do we make a better world? It can't be just better technology, it has to be people-centered innovation. And it's a word that you see more and more. Are our profs changing? I mentioned our students were changing. Are our profs changing uh, in this? Well, we did a survey a couple of years ago, and we asked profs. We said, how do you think about yourself? How do you think about your research? On the one side, we said, you know, extremely interdisciplinary to exclusively disciplinary. How would you characterize your research? And we were astonished, this is 2008, we were astonished by the results. In fact, it's now become not cool to describe yourself as exclusively disciplinary. Fascinating, and this is across the social sciences and humanities, and the third one there is history, which is always good to focus on. And in fact, the most dominant one was quite interdisciplinary, almost 40%, but extremely interdisciplinary, extremely. And this is anonymous, there's no reason to fib and so on, self-characterization, but I think it's an interesting sign. This has big implications for granting councils. We used to have three that were pretty siloed, frankly. One that dealt with the people, social science, humanities. One, natural science and engineering. One, biomedical research, pretty independent. Our approach now is, is we're over, overlapping. We're integrating, we're interrelating in, in really interesting, interesting ways. All of this means we much more work in teams. This is my, the team that, um, the core team that created the Canadian Century Research Infrastructure Project, uh, um, and it's also international. We did that in cooperation with groups in other countries and so on. Uh, it, it's really international. I'm gonna close with some key observations about what I like to call digital scholarship. It's interesting, the phrase data scientist, I think it's gonna have a hard time we, because people like me, we can never think about ourselves as a data scientist. 
So I don't know, we got to develop a 21st century vocabulary, for example, new ways of bringing together, of being inclusive in this world. Why? Because uh, I, I think we're being connected in, 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 in joining together to learn about all aspects of the past and present and to use such learning to help make a better future. And this is interesting. We're research data now. We're also learning data as well as innovation data, and that's really important. Cutting across all fields of inquiry is data become the coin of the 21st century realm, and I think that's really interesting. From studies of colliding particles to research on human thought and behavior, I think it's really, really interesting. And data are now understood in terms of numbers, words, images, sounds, and indeed digital rep representation of all human thought uh, uh, and, and non-human action. And it, it's really interesting. I think we've had some false dichotomies. You know, the people that really like words and the people that really like numbers, you remember in like, so it's grade seven or eight, there's a big divide. People that really like counting, people that really like reading and so on. But at the end of the day, words and numbers are semiotically the same thing. They're all representations. And, and I think those are a lot of false divides that are not are not interesting. This whole notion of, of use, reuse, and repurposing of data, something that the great presentation this morning what was emphasized, and I think that's really interesting. And I think there's also distinctions of blurring between creators and users and so on. And data, as was emphasized, and I like this idea of the software release in terms of a, a dynamic rather than fixed state, and this notion of multiple and iterative in, engagement. Obviously, there are many issues that our conference hasn't talked about that are so important in terms of privacy, confidentiality, ethical barriers, on and on. Illegal, it's, it's a really interesting. We need to work all together to try, to try to figure that out. One of the things that I'm pretty convinced of is in terms of our triangle, for example, I think the digital technology is now far more advanced. And I think those other sides of the triangle really need focus and, and help in terms of really making it e equilateral. Uh, and I think... Um, it's also interesting in terms of the, uh, the connectivity and so on, and the importance of massive data. We really need to think about that in, in lots of interesting ways. And one thing that was emphasized by one of our speakers was this need for skilled and sophisticated people who can work effectively in a digital environment, including technologies, content literacies, the whole, the whole triangle. Uh, and also new ways of thinking about how we're gonna bring this together, moving from a kind of old school cookie cutter approach to standardization to new ways of thinking about this in terms of both and solutions to problems of preservation, interoperability, metadata, data delivery, user interfaces, and so on. And in all this, we need coordination rather than control. And those vertically uh, integrated hierarchies are gone, and we need to think about this in, in new ways. This unevenness, I think, is, is really obvious in the preservation infrastructure, a topic that came up this morning. Um, I think we, I think we have, uh, we're naive about this, and I think it's urgent that we really think about that in terms of sustaining uh, digital scholarship. Similarly, and this was in the session I was just in a little while ago, this notion of moving from an emphasis on data ownership to a provision of data services, the, the example for the Latin American Columbia, for example, where libraries, they used to hold and lend books and so on, and now it's all about access to publications and so on. And I think a lot of this is, is um, you know, different business models need to be worked out in, in, terms of, in, in terms of all this. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, there's a book early on, The Death of Distance now in the new e-world. In fact, that's not true, and that's been alluded to a few times at our conference. In fact, uh, in terms of massive data and so on, location is important. The other thing that's interesting is face-to-face -face interaction. It's, it's interesting, and the magic is combining e-contact with face-to-face, -face, and we're learning more about that in terms of the importance of regional clusters and so on. And, and certainly, uh, we have a good example here. All of this means, though, that we have a lot of work to do in terms of our policies, practices, and so on to really build this robust and sustainable ecosystem for enhanced digital scholarship, because I don't think a lot of our old, old is really gonna work. This week um, the, is the Canada 3.0 conference. You may remember Brazil had their first uh, Brazil 3.0 conference last year that was modeled on this, and we welcomed uh, quite a few dozen Brazilians to the one last year. This is going on. At our research council yesterday, we, were, we organized as part of that the big data workshop. Uh, and on that, on that uh, panel, we had Pat Horgan, the VP at, at IBM uh, Canada, 
Ted Hewitt, who's a, you may know, he's an executive vice president at our research council, but also a Brazilianist. And I know he's very well known here and worked with many of you, Prof from Information Science, one of our researchers who's VP research at a university, and Tom Jenkins, who's um, uh, executive chairman, chief strategy officer at OpenTax, which is Canada's largest software uh, company. Uh, I also want to, I also want to uh, say how important Microsoft is to us in many of these partnerships. Here's one example, Neil Randall's project uh, with working with many collaborators and, and he's working with Microsoft in terms of uh, games and player immersion and trying to understand how the increasingly immersive games uh, are, are, really, are really part of our, our society and why is that and how to engage and motivate players and, and have a, a rich gaming experience. Uh, and that's a really interesting, interesting project. I want to invite you all to continue the conversation that we've had here. If you can, come to Montreal, October 13th to 15th, uh, the World Social Science Forum, entitled Social Transformations in the Digital Age. Already we know representatives from about 58 countries. There's a rich program. Uh, I think the draft program's on the web now. I encourage you to, to check it out. If you'd like to get involved, uh, let us know, and we'd be happy to pursue that. I want to close with some optimism. So think about it. A little over 100 years ago, you know, Albert Einstein's got some paper out, pen, pencil, and he's doing some thought experiments. He's thinking things through, gotten some new ideas and so on. Well, we got serious about that during the course of the 20th century, and we said, hmm, let's check this out. And there was a lot of work went on. Billions and billions of dollars got spent, and you know what? We learned a lot. And similarly, you know, for years, uh, way back, novelists back, there's been the dream of going into outer space. We dreamed that, and, and this is from the early 1950s. Well, we got serious about that. And my hope is that when our descendants look back on us, uh, and they say, well, you know what? You realize that if you're going to build a successful society, you're going to build a better world, that you're going to have to take seriously the challenge of understanding people. And, and rethink uh, how you're organizing society, how you're organizing businesses, schools, on and on, what you mean about all that. And did you take advantage of that and do all you could to make sure that the 21st century worked out as well as I think it might? And I think that's the challenge for all of us. Thank you so much. We have some uh, time for questions. Uh, anyone have a question? You, you didn't mention in your sweeping talk uh, about education uh, MOOCs, all right? And it's interesting to me that uh, the word MOOC was coined in reference to a course given at the University of Manitoba, actually. Uh, I, I wonder what your view was about whether MOOCs are going to change education for real? Such a, such a great question. And I think there are two scenarios. Uh, so, massive open online course. Uh, and I appreciate the, the recognition that, uh, in fact, this was a Canadian expression. And it was first used in, in a paper that we called a knowledge synthesis paper that was done for us related to uh, our attempt to understand changes uh, uh, that were happening uh, on campus. And the title was given, uh, and, there, and there's uh, some really pioneering work. So what, what in one version, the bad version, is that uh, um, a, a well-known, successful prof who's very effective in front of, say, hundreds of students, is basically put online and made freely available to anybody such that if you're interested in a course in, in physics or history or whatever that's being given by a great prof at Harvard or USP or wherever, that you could watch. And that this was really seen as then, well, why would I pay a lot of money to go to Cambridge if I could benefit all that here. Um, 
The problem with that, of course, is, is that, and there's a lot of research on that, is that you can watch one of these lectures and you could find it inspiring. You could find it motivating. You could find it enjoyable. But if you're sitting there passively watching this, you will simply not learn much. And there's just a world of research on this. So if those sort of broadcast MOOCs, in other words, ones that basically take old school teacher-centered pedagogy and put it online, I'm going to say, and, and many university presidents are thinking about this, how to commoditize this, how to, how to make the numbers add up better, how can I do this? Um, and we know, for example, that most of those courses have huge dropout rates. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's really little evidence in terms of learning outcomes that there are any, and it's been very disappointing. There's a newer version that's really trying to run with this, and this is an engagement model. This is not just taking the old school and putting it online and, and letting the great prof be the theatrical performer and communicator and so on. This is really understanding that we have to engage the learner. And it's actively seeking to make students participants in their own learning. And it's focused much more on competencies and so on. Early days, early days. But I think that approach has huge promise and could revolutionize education because clearly education needs revolutionizing because that old model, whether it's in a classroom or whether it's online, is simply we can do better. So I'm very excited about some of the new engagement models, uh, but they have to be student-centered uh, and they have to invite uh, active participation what we call the construction of your own learning, because that's what's going to have the enduring uh, either content retention or better competencies. Let me take this lead and ask one question to the audience, especially to the students here. Who, who, who has taken one of these online, mass online course from beginning to end? Beginning to end. Another question, uh, probably the last one. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you started and did not finish? Yeah, more hands. Including my student. There's lots of research on this now. If people are interested, I'd be happy to share on this. There are lots of studies coming out now. So I think we have time for one more question. So uh, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, part of it that really caught my attention was the part where you were discussing capturing the context around the uh, Canadian census. Um, and it resonated for me because it made me think a little bit about a problem that's been keeping me up at night. And I'm hoping you'll have some <laughs> practical guidance here. Uh-oh, now I'm okay. really scared. So, so, and, and it's totally unfair. So if you have no response to this, that's fine. Okay, so I'm a tool maker and I make tools for people to analyze data. And whenever I make a tool, I like to provide sort of guardrails to keep people from going too far wrong with what they're doing, right? So the part that keeps me up at night is the problem of data interpretation. Mm. So when the data first enters the system, I really don't know much about it and can't really help people interpret what it means. So I'm wondering, especially in light of this capturing context and so on, I mean, is there anything I can do practically as a tool maker to help with the data interpretation problem? I believe strongly, and let me use the T-shape again. I think uh, the whole notion of, you know, the tool, the, the, the service being provided, uh, and there was somewhere along in our conference, there was a scary notion of the black box. Put the data in, you don't know what happens, but someone comes out and says, yeah, those are significant results. I think it's gotta be T-shaped. So uh, if, I think you and I are gonna collaborate, let's say, and you're gonna have your specialty. I'm gonna have my specialty, but we're gonna connect. And I think it, it, it requires us 
to know enough about each other and our issues and so on to have those. And I would say as a result of that, we're going to become co-creators, co-interpreters. Because I think, as I was suggesting, that embedded in what that tool you're going to use is interpretation. You've made a million decisions there. And I think it's, it was a false model that said, just give me the hammer and I'll hit it. And, and, you know, and I think we need that T-shape. And I think it's going to be a very different kind of relationship. I think it's going to have huge implications for our educational system, for example, the whole notion of collaboration and so on. Um, and I think we have a lot of work to do because I think if we don't, I think there's a lot of reason for, for all of us not staying up at night because I think there's so much hidden uh, and, and it's not transparent uh, that it, it could lead us in all kinds of, of unfortunate directions. And I, and I appreciate your sensitivity to it and I think um, it's a huge challenge for our era. I was just told by the organizer that I think we can uh, still keep going. So if there are more questions, please. I think there's one. Oh, I'm. Okay. You tell me when to stop. Yeah, the, the more, I mean, I've loved the last two days because I've learned so much. So the more I can learn right now, I'll be forever grateful. Because as I said, you know, I'm just convinced that we're going to have a rich collaboration. Uh, but the more we get to know each other and understand each other, I think the better. So, yes. So my question is concerning the thing you talked about. Uh, we want to know what the individual is thinking, okay? So uh, this is probably one thing that these social networks are trying to figure out because they want to shape the content to each individual. Personalized everything. Yeah, but in the, on the other hand, when they select the things I see, they select this, the people I see what's happening. They are shaping the way I relate with people. So how these algorithms, these things will influence our social relationship with other people? This is the question. Such an interesting uh, question and, and so complex because Yes, you know, we talk about, you know, customized shopping and, and personalized learning and personalized medicine and everything. But as your, your question is implying, we're social beings. Our, our individual identity is intimately linked to others, right? We, we, we operate in, 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 as you say, these social networks. So I think one of the, one of the I mean, the, I think one of the interesting paradoxes about big data is that, you know, the data is up here but the pursuit and the interest is, you know, what the data mining people talk about is these golden nuggets, right? Trying to understand an individual in a context of a social network, and now not just one social network, but, but uh, as I said, you know, in, my, in, in, in those balloons, you know, the, you, for example, in terms of your community of other researchers, you in terms of the neighbors you live next to, you in terms of the community online that you the visit and so on, right? So how can we situate the individual and connect it in terms of these multiple layers of networks? Uh, and how do we analyze that? And I think it's, you know, the sense of identity, the sense of community now is become so interesting in terms of, you know, it used to be, you know, in the census time, it thought about groups in terms of, okay, you were, there was you, and then there was household members, and then there was, you know, your community, and then maybe your state, and so on, in these, you know, layers of up. But now we know it's not like that. These networks you're talking about are zigzagging in all kinds of interesting ways, right? So that's why I think a lot of the, of the epistemological conversations now are going across uh, why I'm interested in, for example, the bioinformatics as a, in, in terms of, of the humanities, because it, it's the same kind of challenge trying to wrap your head around. Because we know, like it started, you know, with the DNA, it was like, okay, we can isolate this gene and then that will stop this. And it was thought about kind of a linear way. And now we know, no, it's, 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 and so it's not right social networks, but maybe, you know, maybe 
maybe the genomics is, you know, and so how do we think about that? So I think we're just on the edge of a really exciting, interesting time in which our whole research methods, our whole an analytic frameworks and so on are, are going to get a lot more sophisticated. And I think we'll look back on some of what we did in, in the analog era as truly naive. Such a great question, though. But I know it's really late, so I'm happy to, to continue the conversation informally. Please, please, uh, you know, uh, contact us, uh, and we look forward to really building on these conversations. And uh, encore une fois, grand merci et à la prochaine. Obrigado.